There are two ways to beat the cruelty of a harsh environment. You can become stronger or you can become smarter. We did the latter. It seems most improbable that such a physically weak species could take over the planet, not by adding muscles to our skeletons, but by adding neurons to our brains. But we did, and scientists have expended a great deal of effort trying to figure out how. I want to explore four major concepts that not only set the stage for all of the brain rules, but also explain how we came to conquer the world. We can make things up. One trait really does separate us from the gorillas, the ability to use symbolic reasoning. When we see a five-sided geometric shape, we're not stuck perceiving it as a pentagon. We can just as easily perceive the U.S. military headquarters or a Chrysler minivan. Our brains can behold a symbolic object as real by itself and yet, simultaneously, also representing something else. That's what my son was doing when he brandished his stick sword. Researcher Judy Deloach calls it dual representational theory. Stated formally, it describes our ability to attribute characteristics and meanings to things that don't actually possess them. Stated informally, we can make things up that aren't there. We are human because we can fantasize. We are so good at dual representation, we combine symbols to derive layers of meaning. It gives us the capacity for language and for writing down that language. It gives us the capacity to reason mathematically. It gives us the capacity for art. Combinations of circles and squares become geometry and cubist paintings. Combinations of dots and squiggles become music and poetry. There is an unbroken intellectual line between symbolic reasoning and the ability to create culture, and no other creature is capable of doing it. The all-important human trait of symbolic reasoning helped our species not only survive, but thrive. Our evolutionary ancestors didn't have to keep falling into the same quicksand pit if they could tell others about it, even better if they learned to put up warning signs. With words, with language, we could extract a great deal of knowledge about our living situation without always having to experience its harsh lessons directly. It makes sense that once our species evolved to have symbolic reasoning, we kept it. So what was it about our environment that would give a survival advantage to those who could reason symbolically? We adapted to variation itself. Most of what we know about the intellectual progress of our species is based on evidence of tool-making. That's not necessarily the most accurate indicator, but it's the best we've got. For the first few million years, the record is not very impressive. We mostly just grabbed rocks and smashed them into things. Scientists, perhaps trying to salvage some of our dignity, call these stones hand axes. A million years later, we still grabbed hand axes, but now we began smashing them into other rocks, making them more pointed. Now we had sharper rocks. It wasn't much, but it was enough to begin untethering ourselves from a sole reliance on our East African womb and indeed any other ecological niche. Then things started to get interesting. We created fire and started cooking our food. Eventually, we migrated out of Africa in successive waves, our direct Homo sapiens ancestors making the journey as little as 100,000 years ago. Then, 40,000 years ago, something almost unbelievable happened. Our ancestors suddenly took up painting and sculpture, creating fine art and jewelry. This change was both abrupt and profound. 37,000 years later, we were making pyramids. 5,000 years after that, rocket fuel. Many scientists think our growth spurt can be explained by the onset of dual representation abilities. And many think our dual representational abilities, along with physical changes that precipitated them, can be explained by a nasty change in the weather. Most of human prehistory occurred in jungle-like climates, steamy, humid, and in dire need of air conditioning. This was comfortably predictable. Then the climate changed. Ice cores taken from Greenland show that the climate staggers from being unbearably hot to being sadistically cold. As little as 100,000 years ago, you could be born in a nearly Arctic environment, but then, mere decades later, be taking off your loincloth to catch the golden rays of the grassland sun. Such instability was bound to have a powerful effect on any creature forced to endure it. 
Most could not. The rules for survival were changing, and a new class of creatures would start to fill the vacuum created as more and more of their roommates died out. The change was enough to shake us out of our comfortable trees, but it wasn't violent enough to kill us when we landed. Landing was only the beginning of the hard work, however. Faced with grasslands rather than trees, we were rudely introduced to the idea of flat. We quickly discovered that our new digs were already occupied. The locals had co-opted the food sources, and most of them were stronger and faster than we were. It is disconcerting to think that we started our evolutionary journey on an unfamiliar horizontal plane with the words, Eat me! I'm prey! taped to our evolutionary butts. 